Hi, welcome to the Signal Path. It's that time of the year again. We're just one month away from the International Solid State Circuit Conference, which happens in San Francisco, California, in the United States. Now, in this conference, experts from all around the world, academia, as well as the industry and students, come to show the latest and greatest area of research in integrated circuits across almost every topic you can imagine. I'm actually giving a tutorial this year at the conference called The Art of Millimeter Wave Layout, among many other fantastic tutorials and forums and, of course, paper presentations that the conference has. And I hope that you can join us there. It's great that we can have these events in person again and we can get together and exchange ideas. I hope I get to see you there. Now, I thought that as a way of celebrating this event again, let's take a look at another integrated circuit. We're going to take a look at an Infineon 24 GHz radar module, but really from end to end. Look at the module, how it works from the top down view, going all the way down into the IC, actually removing it from the package and looking at it at the microscope and reverse engineering what's on there. And we can see exactly how these very high frequency stuff is put together. Kind of similar to what I'll be covering in the tutorial as well, but this is specifically for this chipset. I think it's going to be really interesting. So let's get started. And here's a radar module that we really want to understand and dig into all of its design parameters. So the main radar chip is tiny, it's right there in the middle, and antennas are of course on the other side of this board. There it is, as you can see. But I really want to understand exactly how it's put together, and also the architecture of the chip of course. So let's start with that. So before we go ahead and take the radar chip off the board and look at a die under the microscope, it's really important to understand the overall architecture of the radar module because Infineon has spent a lot of time, of course, designing the chip, but also to reduce in the cost as much as they can to build the most minimalist 24 gigahertz radar you can have while maintaining some of the nice features that comes with being able to detect the range of the Doppler and so on. So let's see how they've done that. So of course, we do have a 5 volt power supply coming in at the very, very top, and we do have an LDO right away. This LDO is going to run our microcontroller at 3.3 volts. It's also going to give power to the radar chipset too. Now, if you look at the microcontroller, this microcontroller doesn't really need to do very much. It can have ADCs built into it, which it does, and these ADCs deal with very low frequency IF signals, so the digitization bandwidth is not very high. But once you digitize them, you can run the FFT and the DSP functions directly inside the microcontroller. So at very low power, you can get the necessary information to get the radar functions you want, at least at the kind of radar that this is going to function. They're also going to take the rest of the IOs available and control various other things on the board, as we will see. So that part from the microcontroller, we're not going to get too much into. As the radar computation, we're going to leave that for a separate video. But let's see what happens to the rest of the system. Then we do have a high side PMOS switch, and that's controlled from the microcontroller as well. And this allows you to disconnect the power supply from the entire radar chipset. And this is good if you want to make a pulse radar, or if you just want to turn the radar off in order to save some power consumption. Now, inside the chip itself, there are quite a few components, but the most simple radar, pretty much the most simple radar you can build. There's a PTAT in there, and that's going to be temperature compensated, and we're going to use that for some clever techniques to stabilize the VCO output frequency, as we will see in a second. So that's a separate block in there, and it also has its own power supply control that you can turn on and off. Now, what do we need from the radar's point of view at 24 gigahertz? Well, we need to transmit the 24 gigahertz signal out, connect it to an antenna, and listen to the reflection coming back. And the reflection is going to experience a Doppler shift when there is a movement, and that Doppler shift has to be digitized. And that's what we're actually interested in. So let's see how that is done. So we have the antenna, of course, which is going to have the 24 gigahertz leaving on one side, and then the other set of antennas, which is going to be on the receive side. Now, on the transmitter, they do have a differential PA, and that differential PA is connected to a ballon, converting it to a single-ended because the feed line to the antenna itself is single-ended. And they do have a ballon at the input of the PA as well because the signal going into the entire system is single-ended. So basically, they really wanted to use a differential PA, so they have put a ballon at the input and output. This is not uncommon. A lot of people do this, depending on how the architecture of this chip is. There's also a, apparently a TX control pin that you can turn the PA on and off, which is nice because if you turn the PA off, you would still save a lot of power and you can bring the radar back online much faster than if you turn the entire chip on and off. Now on the receiver, things are a little bit more complicated. Now the receiver, we also have a single-ended antenna, and then they put that through a ballon too, which means that they really wanted to use a differential and a name. So that has its own advantages, but there's going to be some additional losses because of the ballon first architecture. But I guess that's a price they're willing to pay, and it is useful to isolate the signal from the LNA as much as you can, and differential signaling, of course, does that. Now, the two outputs of the LNA themselves are now two independent single-ended signals, and they need two differential ones, so they have yet more balance 
following it. So what you end up with is a pair of differential signals at the end. And they do this because their mixers are indeed differential on all of these ports. Although I do think that the IF ports are single-ended in this chip, or at least they only use the single-ended part. And on the other side, we have the VCO signal going into the balance, becoming differential into a polyphase filter, which is going to create a 0 and a 90 degree signal. This is all differential too. And then you get the IFQ and the IFI. Now, having an IQ down converter has a huge advantage in this architecture because you have image rejection, which means that when the signal experiences a positive Doppler shift or a negative Doppler shift, you can actually tell the difference because you can look at the phase of the IFI and the IFQ signal. So you can tell when the target is moving away or moving towards the radar. And that's the entire reason why this is done this way. Now the VCO itself has two outputs, and all they're doing is that they're taking one side into one, which is a transmitter, and on the other side into the other balance, which is the receiver. This is an exceptionally common technique for building radars like this. And of course, the entire thing is coherent. So the phasers of the VCO isn't super critical because the range of this radar is not very long. So you, you are within the coherence length where you get phase noise cancellation. These are all basic radar concepts that a lot of people take advantage of. There's also a frequency divider here, which allows you to divide the frequency of the VCO and wrap a PLL around this if you want to. And that would mean that you can have a much, much better phase noise. You can also perhaps do some simple FMCW radar functions. So let me get rid of some of these markers here. It's not getting too busy. Now, one of the other things you need to make sure of is that when you power this thing on, this VCO is designed to work at 24 gigahertz, but it needs to remain within the ISM band. And in order to ensure that, they have a PTAT coming in and controlling the tune voltage of the VCO. So as the temperature of this chip changes, the PTAT allows you to maintain an output frequency which is within the specification of the ISM. So this is basically ensuring that they're not having emissions anywhere else where they're not supposed to. There are other techniques that are also applied, as we will see on the board. So what else do we have after this? Well, once you have generated the IFI and IFQ signals, now you need to digitize that. Now, this thing does not have a very large baseband built into it, so there's not a lot of amplification, and therefore they need another batch of amplifiers afterwards to boost that signal up to a point where it can be digitized at full scale by the ADCs inside the microcontroller. There's also a high-pass filter in there, and you can imagine why, because the leakage between the TX to the RX will be get down-converted to DC, and you need to reject that DC signal, and you also want to reject the 1 over F noise of the, of the radar itself, and all of that is done, and that's why you have the high-pass filter. So from an architecture point of view, this is pretty much the most basic radar you can build. The only other thing you can remove from this to make it even simpler is to not do IQ down conversion. But then again, then you lose the ability to be able to tell if the uh, Doppler shift is positive or negative. So they have put that in there, which is very nice. So for the size of this chip, it's really an attractive solution because the cost is going to be so small to build one of these and you can do some interesting applications with it. So what is a couple of things that they've built? Well, here's an example of what they're proposing. And you can have, a, let's say, a vehicle moving towards or away from the radar, and then you can measure the exact the speed. And you can also measure the direction of the car just by looking at the IQ signal, which are the Doppler shifts. These are basic radar functions, and the FFD, of course, is calculated inside the microprocessor. Now, a couple of numbers here just for the sake of completion. For example, you can see that the TX Apple power is ranged from 2 to 10 dBm, which is a massive range. Of course, this is a data sheet, so they have to cover all corners. This seems like the average power of 6 dBm is what they're aiming for. And the VCO's free-running phase noise minus 55 dBc per hertz. I think I just forgot to cut this out. On this side, it's a 100 kilohertz offset. The noise figure is about 10 dB, which is okay on single sideband. And then you also have the conversion gain of the actual receiver about 20 dB. And then you have the noise figure of 10 dB repeated twice here. And the input compression is minus 28 dBm, which is fine for something like this. They do allow themselves a huge amount of quadrature imbalance, up to 24 degrees, which is a lot, and a, but a plus or minus 1 dB of uh, amplitude imbalance. This is the basic way of evaluating the performance of this radar. These are some of the critical parameters. There's a lot more in the data sheet, of course. Now let's look at the fun part, which is looking at the module and the board itself. So here's the radar chipset. You can see how tiny it is. This is the microprocessor. Relatively speaking, it's quite a big difference in size. Here's our PMOS switch, which is going to turn the chip on and off. And we do have our baseband amplifiers here and here. And we do have a 1.65 reference generator 
in the middle which allows the op amps to run from a reference in the middle of the power supply which I will show you at the very end. There's an unpopular component here which I think is the another PMOS switch that they didn't incorporate for turning something else in the chip on and off maybe the PTAT or the frequency divider which is not being used. Now the RF outputs and inputs of the chip are at exactly the same frequency so it makes sense to make them perfectly symmetric which is exactly what we have. We have the RF port on one side and the RF port on the other side. It could be the other way around. It really doesn't matter. They're exactly the same in both cases. And then the very f we have a bit of matching network in the way. And then we have this component here, which galvanically isolates the two sides, so you can act as a DC block. So isolating the DC from both sides, it has also a bit of advantage in some EST situations. And then we have two quarter wavelength stubs. These quarter wavelength stubs are nice because they block out all the other harmonics that you don't want, allowing you to filter what hits the actual antennas even more helps with the FCC rules and also helps with rejecting unwanted signals. And then after that, the signal goes in right through the via and then pops out from the other side of the board, which is right over here, and then it connects into these traces. And these traces are phase matched to a point where all of these four patch antennas are now coherently excited by the transmit signal. You can see a slit cut out inside of the patch, very common technique for manipulating the bandwidth of these patch antennas and the gain and so on. You can actually even find out exactly what those dimensions should be. It's mathematically computed. So it's really pretty straightforward. And you can see that they have removed, of course, the solder mask and they're perfectly symmetric in the middle. And it looks like some vias perhaps for further isolation that is put in there. It's interesting, hugging both sides of this component here in the middle. And that's where the chip sits on the other side over here. And that essentially means that it has vias through the entire ground plane and everything. There's nothing on the other side at the bottom. And then we have another microprocessor over here. And this, all this does is that it communicates with the USB. It has no other function as part of the radar. In fact, you can snap this off in the middle, right over here. These, these vias are connected through the board. But if you snap this, then this becomes an independent module. You can communicate to it through this header. So it's a clever little idea so that if you don't need this part, you can just break it off. So here's the x-ray, and in the x-ray we can see through the board, of course, you can see the patch antennas on the other side, you can see the symmetry that is used to connect everything from one side to the other. This piece over here that's made of metal, and you can see that over here, you can see this on the other side of the patch antenna, so there is a ground plane in the middle isolating everything. Now in the datasheet they give you a little bit of the top level layout, so I superimposed it, and you can see how nicely it lines up with the x-ray. So when you superimpose, you can see that indeed, yes, the x-ray and the layout at the top level match, of course. But this layout is only for one layer. We get to see through the entire board and seeing some of the other routing as well at the bottom. Now these antennas are four in a line, so it's a linear phased array essentially. So it does some beam forming, but you just cannot electronically beam steer it. And they do provide a simulated radiation pattern on this in far field, and that's, a, that's what it looks like. Now if you look at this, it immediately makes sense that the beam is narrow in this direction, right but really wide in this direction and that makes sense because the four antenna elements that are in a row make a fan-shaped beam radiation and they bring the beam together and that's why you also have these side lobes you have the side lobes because this is a synthetic aperture made from the multiple antennas this is all phased array theory we can perhaps do a different video about that but it's nice to see the radiation pattern is also provided i believe the overall antenna gain is about 10 dbi or so with the four of course in one direction so pretty nice all of it lines up quite beautifully and you can see right through it. Now we're going to remove this of course and we're going to look at the die and that's going to really dig into seeing how those RF components are made. Now one last thing I, I did want to cover again for completion is how they handle the IFI and IFQ on the board. So here are the two, two signals coming from the mixer itself and then afterwards here's the 1.65 volt that they use as a reference because these signals are single-ended and they must be 1.65 volt uh, relative to that voltage and then you just have two op-amps in a row one over here one over here and these are simply uh, high-pass filter configurations and so on and you pass that out and that's the response of the whole thing so the entire down conversion gain seems like is quite a bit higher now it's at 50 db or so and then you do have a frequency response so they cut everything out at around let's say something close to 23 hertz and they cut everything above 1.8 kilohertz so the entire radar doppler signature has to live within this deviation from the carrier okay and then you can calculate that if you see go all the way back here in our slides you can see that they have some calculations for example of what that frequency would be if you were to try and measure the speed of a car
but it's important. The IF section is, is really crucial because at this point you're removing the DC, which I mentioned you have to do because that's the leakage through the radar. And at this point you have too much high frequency. They're not interested in measuring that much Doppler shift anyway. And that makes the entire radar module. So very nicely explained in their own data sheet, of course, and we can dig into it and analyze it further. So now let's do the fun part. Take a look at the chip. And here's our IC under the microscope. This is a magnification of just over 50, and you can see it cleaned up very nicely. After removing the packaging, you can also see the residue of the wire bonding that was surrounding the IC in some of these pads. Not all of its pads are used when it's inside of the QFN package. So now when we're looking at it at this view, we should be able to identify the primary components that we saw when we were looking at the block diagram. So this should be quite obvious at this view. And if you look a little bit carefully, notice that right here at the heart, we have our VCO. And this VCO signal is going to have to divide between the transmitter and the receiver. And indeed, we see that half of the signal goes this way, and half the signal coming out of the VCO goes that way. We can also see the tank inductor of the VCO, which we will take a much closer look at at every one of these blocks individually. Now, we're also looking for a power amplifier and an LNA. Now, on this side, we see two identical structures. And these structures would have to be our mixer, especially because the LO is also reaching it. So if you have an IQ mixer, the LNA would be the closest block to the mixer. That would be the logical flow planning of something like this, and therefore this would be our LNA, which feeds the signal into our IQ mixer. And that leaves the other side, which is this block over here, as our power amplifier. Now again, this power amplifier, we're talking about a 6 dBm component, but nonetheless is still a power amplifier in the context of this chip. There's a bunch of other things here that we can take a look at, probably the PTAT and some of the other configuration. But the global structure of this is now pretty straightforward, and we can identify the components. So let's now zoom in a bit more, go to over 100, and take a look, and look at some of these blocks closely. And here's a closer look at the die. We're looking at the LNA input side. So that means that this is a ground pad. Well, that's a ground pad, and that's a signal pad, so you're coming with the coplanar wavecrest structure into the input of the LNA. There are actually three things connected to it. There's a very, very long stub. Look at that, wrapped all around. Its length is, of course, determined by the frequency of operation here. And that most likely is a quarter wavelength or something they're hanging off of that. I have to measure the exact length. And there's also a shunt inductor. So they're probably using this combination for ESD as well as harmonic rejection at the input. Then there is this structure over here, which is a single-ended to differential conversion. Now, it looks like this is an LC-based structure to create 180-degree out-of-phase signals, and then you'll end up with two signals here and here. They're not using a transformer, which is interesting, but most likely they don't need to because this doesn't have a very high bandwidth, so they can get away with using just an LC structure like this. And then we have our differential LNA, which you can see has two loads. That's a differential structure. And then there's a second stage following it. So this is a two-stage LNA, which is itself also not that unusual. So let me raise this, getting out of the way here. And then we see the two signals of the LNA. One of them is used for the I or Q mixer, and the other one is used for the other one. There's some length matching over here between these two. So they're basically using the differential output of the LNA to feed a mixer. And that's not uncommon neither. You can actually do this because you already have two signals available to you that are out of phase. There are some minor disadvantages to that, but it's really not that significant. And then there is another single into the differential converter structure here, another one over here. They love this LC structure. They keep repeating it. And here's our mixer core over here and over here with its loads. And I believe that this entire section here is our polyphase filter, which means that we should have two signals, and we do. You can see there's two lines over here. That's the two signals for the LO of the mixer coming in, going into the polyphase filter, then feeding the mixers. So all of that makes perfect sense, very basic structures, and exactly like it is on the block diagram. Here we go. So now looking at the other side of the chip, like so, we see the, the rest of that structure. So exactly the same way you see a single ended to differential conversion here too, that's to convert the LO signal from one side of the VCO to differential. So this was the LOs we were just looking at. And then they're converting it to single ended to differential once again, so they can feed this PA structure. So now this is a differential PA, and then converting it back to single-ended over here, and then connecting it to the pad once again, and exactly the same structure is hanging off of the PA pad, which makes sense. The input and output frequency of this are essentially the same. 
they're only difference by hundreds of kilohertz. So therefore, you can use exactly the same structure and get exactly the same performance as far as these frequencies are concerned. So all of that looks very nice and very simple. Again, engineering solutions that are simple are often the best because there is no reason to complicate things. Now we can also look at the VCO a little bit more. And here's our VCO core. There's our main tank inductor in the middle. And then we have a whole bunch of long lines in there. And this structure in the middle, which I want to take a look at a bit closer to tell you what it is, but the signal from the VCO ends up here and here, which we just saw, and it splits into two. Now this in the middle, I believe, are fuses, which they can do to tune the actual standard frequency of the VCO against process variation. So they must be doing some factory testing to tune this and then just figure out what fuses need to be blown out and that way you get the exact frequency you want because this thing only can operate within 250 megahertz at 24 gigahertz that's it if you go outside of that you're violating the mask there so that's interesting that they have to do this in with fuses which kind of makes sense i think this is a uh, often what is done at this scale now this is a silicon germanium process that i forgot to mention uh, also by infineon i think this is their own internal process there is also a path from the transmitter to the receiver it goes up there and that also has fuses on it so I wonder if in the factory what they're doing is that they're actually doing some self-test by connecting the input and the output and then blowing up the fuses when they're done because they don't need that path that's just a guess but it could be that's what they're doing because they're blowing up this fuse and that fuse and I think we should really look at those fuses a bit closer so we can appreciate what they look like and here's also the dark field view of this, which reveals some additional interesting pieces of information. Note these blue squares that you see. Those are the metal fields underneath these inductors in non-critical areas where they've managed to remove it. But you do need to have some to meet the density requirements, of course, of ICs in general. But under the VCO tank, there is none. So they've removed that to make sure that this is really well modeled as well as getting the highest quality factors they possibly can from this inductor because that's of course the phase noise of the VCO. So that's interesting to see. But if we zoom in further, then we can actually observe the fuses. And here's magnification of over 200. And check it out. This set of fuses are intact, but this set of fuses have been blown. And so by basically blowing these fuses, you change the effective length of this loop so right now the loop basically ends here so they're closing it this way because the rest of them are all shorted out but if I blow another fuse it extends further and I think that's how they're trimming the VCO to be in the center frequency they want probably during some factory testing situation which is interesting but because we're also looking at such a high magnification and our depth of field is narrow we can walk through the depth of field with a microscope and slowly see what it looks like as we focus deeper and deeper into the IC so you can see the inner layers now coming into focus as we go in. You can appreciate how many layers there are, of course, in this IC. Coming back all the way to the top layer. Now I'm going to change also to the dark field. And then we can take a look and see how those fuses look under the dark field view. And under the dark field view, the blown fuses look a lot more obvious because they scatter light a lot more as the structure is much more random as it literally has been melted away. So you can see that these four fuses are completely gone and these other five are intact. And these two other ones that I thought for feedback between the TX and RX are also fully blown. And here you can also appreciate the difference between the layers when it comes to having the metal fill. So if you focus down a bit, there you go, we can see we're now focused on the edge of the metal film and there is nothing under the inductor here. Whereas on the left side, there is indeed stuff under the inductor right over here. So that all makes sense. And this is also a common technique for very, very critical structures. You do want to exclude the metal field as far as the foundry actually allows you to do. It's not always allowed depending on the process that you're using. But it's very nice to see this under dark field as we zoom into the different layers. A whole bunch of additional features come into view. And last but not least, we can use the DIC microscopy technique to see the surface imperfections of the layers. As I walk through the, the phase of the DIC, take a look at the metallization surface and look how it changes. You can see exactly those cast shadows that represent the differences in the height. Now we're talking about tiny, tiny differences here, but of course we can bring out those features by playing with the phase and creating an interference, destructive interference at the surface. It's always really interesting to look at the material this way, especially things that look completely smooth. They actually aren't at all. For example, here these inductors, if I walk through this again, once I achieve a, a good focus here at the surface, you can see 
that there is indeed quite a bit of surface roughness on these as we go through the different settings. It's very cool, always really fun to watch. And there you have it, I hope you enjoyed this detailed look at the Infineon 24 GHz radar chipset and the module as a whole, and I hope that I get to see you at the ISSCC 2023 in San Francisco. We can get together and talk about all the fantastic stuff that's happening in the industry and the state-of-the-art circuit design that will be presented at the conference. So, I'll see you there.